Section 13 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Schneider. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Lecture 5 The Works of Iron in Nature, Art, and Policy. Part 3 Iron in Policy. Having thus obtained some idea of the use of iron in art as dependent on its ductility, I need not certainly say anything of its uses in manufacture and commerce. We all of us know enough, perhaps a little too much, about them. So I pass lastly to consider its uses in policy, dependent chiefly upon its tenacity, that is to say on its power of bearing a pull and receiving an edge. These powers, which enable it to pierce, to bind, and to smite, render it fit for the three great instruments by which its political action may be simply typified, namely the plow, the fetter, and the sword. On our understanding the right use of these three instruments depend, of course, all our power as a nation, and all our happiness as individuals. THE PLOW I say first on our understanding the right use of the plow with which, in justice to the fairest of our laborers, we must always associate that feminine plow, the needle. The first requirement for the happiness of a nation is that it should understand the function in this world of these two great instruments. A happy nation may be defined as one in which the husband's hand is on the plow and the housewife's on the needle so in due time reaping its golden harvest and shining in golden vesture. And an unhappy nation is one which acknowledging no use of plough nor needle will assuredly at last find its storehouse empty in the famine and its breast naked to the cold. Perhaps you think this is a mere truism, which I am wasting your time in repeating. I wish it were. By far the greater part of the suffering and crime which exist at this moment in civilized Europe arises simply from people not understanding this truism, not knowing that produce or wealth is eternally connected by the laws of heaven and earth with resolute labor, but hoping in some way to cheat or abrogate this everlasting law of life, and to feed where they have not furrowed, and to warm where they have not woven. I repeat, nearly all our misery and crime result from this one misapprehension. The law of nature is that a certain quantity of work is necessary to produce a certain quantity of good, of any kind whatever. If you want knowledge, you must toil for it. If food, you must toil for it. And if pleasure, you must toil for it. But men do not acknowledge this law or strive to evade it, hoping to get their knowledge and food and pleasure for nothing. And in this effort they either fail of getting them and remain ignorant and miserable, or they obtain them by making other men work for their benefit, and then they are tyrants and robbers. Yes, and worse than robbers, I am not one who in the least doubts or disputes the progress of this century in many things useful to mankind, but it seems to me a very dark sign respecting us that we look with so much indifference upon dishonesty and cruelty in the pursuit of wealth. In the dream of Nebuchadnezzar it was only the feet that were part of iron and part of clay, but many of us are now getting so cruel in our avarice that it seems as if in us the heart were part of iron and part of clay. From what I have heard of the inhabitants of this town, I do not doubt but that I may be permitted to do here what I have found it usually thought elsewhere highly improper and absurd to do, namely trace a few Bible sentences in their practical result. You cannot but have noticed how often in those parts of the Bible, which are likely to be oft open when people look for guidance, comfort, or help in the affairs of daily life, namely the Psalms and Proverbs, mention is made of the guilt attaching to the oppression of the poor. Observe, not the neglect of them, but the oppression of them. The word is as frequent as it is strange. You can hardly open either of those books, but somewhere in their pages you will find a description of the wicked man's attempts against the poor, such as, He doth ravish the poor when he getteth him into his net. 
he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages his eyes are privily set against the poor in his pride he doth persecute the poor and blesseth the covetous whom god abhorreth his mouth is full of deceit and fraud in the secret places doth he murder the innocent have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread they have drawn out the sword and bent the bow to cast down the poor and needy they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression pride compasseth them about as a chain and violence as a garment their poison is like the poison of a serpent ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth yes ye weigh the violence of your hands weigh these words as well the last things we ever usually think of weighing are bible words we like to dream and dispute over them but to weigh them and see what their true contents are anything but that yet weigh these for i have purposely taken all these verses perhaps more striking to you read in this connection than separately in their places out of the psalms because for all people belonging to the established church of this country these psalms are appointed lessons portioned out to them by their clergy to be read once through every month presumably therefore whatever portions of scripture we may pass by or forget these at all events must be brought continually to our observance as useful for direction of daily life now do we ever ask ourselves what the real meaning of these passages may be and who these wicked people are who are murdering the innocent you know it is rather singular language this rather strong language we might perhaps call it hearing it for the first time murder and murder of innocent people nay even a sort of cannibalism eating people yes and god's people too eating my people as if they were bred swords drawn bows bent poison of serpents mixed violence of hands weighed measured and trafficked with as so much coin where is all this going on do you suppose it was only going on in the time of david and that nobody but jews ever murder the poor if so it would surely be wiser not to mutter and mumble for our daily lessons what does not concern us but if there be any chance that it may concern us and if this description in the psalms of human guilt is at all generally applicable as the descriptions in the psalms of human sorrow are may it not be advisable to know wherein this guilt is being committed round about us or by ourselves and when we take the words of the bible into our mouths in a congregational way to be sure whether we mean merely to chant a piece of melodious poetry relating to other people we know not exactly to whom or to assert our belief in facts bearing somewhat stringently on ourselves and our daily business and if you make up your minds to do this no longer and take pains to examine into the matter you will find that these strange words occurring as they do not in a few places only but almost in every alternate psalm and every alternate chapter of proverb or prophecy with tremendous reiteration were not written for one nation or one time only but for all nations and languages for all places and all centuries and it is as true of the wicked man now as ever it was of nabal or dives that his eyes are set against the poor set against the poor mind you not merely set away from the poor so as to neglect or lose sight of them but set against so as to afflict and destroy them this is the main point i want to fix your attention upon you will often hear sermons about neglect or carelessness of the poor but neglect and carelessness are not at all the points the bible hardly ever talks about neglect of the poor it always talks of oppression of the poor a very different matter it does not merely speak of passing by on the other side and binding up no wounds but of drawing the sword and ourselves smiting the men down it does not charge us with being idle in the pest house and giving no medicine but with being busy in the pest house and giving much poison may we not advisedly look into this matter a little even to-night and ask first who are these poor no country is or ever will be without them 
that is to say without the class which cannot on the average do more by its labor than provide for its subsistence and which has no accumulations of property laid by on any considerable scale now there are a certain number of this class whom we cannot oppress with much severity an able-bodied and intelligent workman sober honest and industrious will almost always command a fair price for his work and lay by enough in a few years to enable him to hold his own in the labor market but all men are not able-bodied nor intelligent nor industrious and you cannot expect them to be nothing appears to me at once more ludicrous and more melancholy than the way the people of the present age usually talk about the morals of laborers you hardly ever address a laboring man upon his prospects in life without quietly assuming that he is to possess at starting as a small moral capital to begin with the virtue of socrates the philosophy of plato and the heroism of epaminondas be assured my good man you say to him that if you work steadily for ten hours a day all your life long and if you drink nothing but water or the very mildest beer and live on very plain food and never lose your temper and go to church every sunday and always remain content in the position in which providence has placed you and never grumble nor swear and always keep your clothes decent and rise early and use every opportunity of improving yourself you will get on very well and never come to the parish all this is exceedingly true but before giving the advice so confidently it would be well if we sometimes tried it practically ourselves and spent a year or so at some hard manual labor not an entertaining kind ploughing or digging for instance with a very moderate allowance of beer nothing but bread and cheese for dinner no papers nor muffins in the morning no sofas nor magazines at night one small room for parlor and kitchen and a large family of children always in the middle of the floor if we think we could under these circumstances enact socrates or epaminondas entirely to our own satisfaction we shall be somewhat justified in requiring the same behavior from our poorer neighbors but if not we should surely consider a little whether among the various forms of the oppression of the poor we may not rank as one of the first and likeliest the oppression of expecting too much from them but let us pass and let it be admitted that we can never be guilty of oppression towards the sober industrious intelligent exemplary laborer there will always be in the world some who are not altogether intelligent and exemplary we shall i believe to the end of time find the majority somewhat unintelligent a little inclined to be idle and occasionally on saturday night drunk we must even be prepared to hear of reprobates who like skittles on sunday morning better than prayers and of unnatural parents who send their children out to beg instead of to go to school now these are the kind of people whom you can oppress and whom you do oppress and that to purpose and with all the more cruelty and the greater sting because it is just their own fault that puts them into your power you know the words about wicked people are he doth ravish the poor when he getteth him into his net this getting into the net is constantly the fault or folly of the sufferer his own heedlessness or his own indolence but after he is once in the net the oppression of him and making the most of his distress are ours the nets which we use against the poor are just those worldly embarrassments which either their ignorance or their improvidence are almost certain at some time or other to bring them into then just at the time when we ought to hasten to help them and disentangle them and teach them how to manage better in future we rush forward to pillage them and force all we can out of them in their adversity for to take one instance only remember this is literally and simply what we do whenever we buy or try to buy cheap goods goods offered at a price which we know cannot be remunerative for the labor involved in them whenever we buy such goods remember we are stealing somebody's labor don't let us mince the matter i say in plain saxon stealing taking from him the proper reward of his work and putting it into our own pocket you know well enough that the thing could not have been offered you at that price unless distress of some kind had forced the producer to part with it you take advantage of this distress 
and you force as much out of him as you can under the circumstances the old barons of the middle ages used in general thumbscrews to extort property we moderns use in preference hunger or domestic affliction but the fact of extortion remains precisely the same whether we force the man's property from him by pitching his stomach or pinching his fingers makes some difference anatomically morally none whatsoever we use a form of torture of some sort in order to make him give up his property we use indeed the man's own anxieties instead of the rack and his immediate peril of starvation instead of the pistol at the head but otherwise we differ from front de boeuf or dick turpin merely in being less dexterous more cowardly and more cruel more cruel i say because the fierce baron and the redoubted highwayman are reported to have robbed at least by preference only the rich we steal habitually from the poor we buy our liveries and gild our prayer-books with pilfered pence out of children's and sick men's wages and thus ingeniously dispose a given quantity of theft so that it may produce the largest possible measure of delicately distributed suffering but this is only one form of common oppression of the poor only one way of taking our hands off the plough handle and binding another's upon it this first way of doing it is the economical way the way preferred by prudent and virtuous people the bolder way is the acquisitive way the way of speculation you know we are considering at present the various modes in which a nation corrupts itself by not acknowledging the eternal connection between its plough and its pleasure by striving to get pleasure without working for it well i say the first and the commonest way of doing so is to try to get the product of other people's work and enjoy it ourselves by cheapening their labor in times of distress then the second way is that grand one of watching the chances of the market the way of speculation of course there are some speculations that are fair and honest speculations made with our own money and which do not involve in their success the loss by others of what we gain but generally modern speculation involves much risk to others with chance of profit only to ourselves even in its best conditions it is merely one of the forms of gambling or treasure hunting it is either leaving the steady plough and the steady pilgrimage of life to look for silver mines beside the way or else it is the full stop beside the dice tables in vanity fair investing all the thoughts and passions of the soul in the fall of the cards and choosing rather the wild accidents of idle fortune than the calm and accumulative rewards of toil and this is destructive enough at least to our peace and virtue but is usually destructive of far more than our peace and our virtue have you ever deliberately set yourselves to imagine and measure the suffering the guilt and the mortality caused necessarily by the failure of any large dealing merchant or largely branched bank take it at the lowest possible supposition count at the fewest you choose the families whose means of support have been involved in the catastrophe then on the morning after the intelligence of ruin let us go forth amongst them in earnest thought let us use that imagination which we waste so often on fictitious sorrow to measure the stern facts of that multitudinous distress strike open the private doors of their chambers and enter silently into the midst of the domestic misery look upon the old men who had reserved for their failing strength some remainder of rest in the evening tide of life cast helplessly back into its trouble and tumult look upon the active strength of middle age suddenly blasted into incapacity its hopes crushed and its hardly earned rewards snatched away in the same instant at once the heart withered and the right arm snapped look upon the piteous children delicately nurtured whose soft eyes now large with wonder at their parents grief must soon be set in the dimness of famine and far more than all this look forward to the length of sorrow beyond to the hardest labor of life now to be undergone either in all the severity of unexpected and inexperienced trial or else more bitter still to be begun again and endured for the second time amidst the ruins of cherished hopes and the feebleness of advanced years 
embittered by the continual sting and the taunt of the inner feeling that it has all been brought about not by the fair course of appointed circumstance but by miserable chance and wanton treachery and last of all look beyond this to the shattered destinies of those who have faltered under the trial and sunk past recovery to despair and then consider whether the hand which has poured this poison into life be one whit less guiltily red with human blood than that which literally pours the hemlock into the cup or guides the dagger to the heart we read with horror the crimes of a borgia or a tofana but there never lived borgias such as live now in the midst of us the real cruel lady of ferrara slew only in the storm of passion she slew only a few those who thwarted her purposes or who vexed her soul she slew sharply and suddenly embittering the fate of her victims with no foretastes of destruction no prolongations of pain and finally and chiefly she slew not without remorse not without pity but we in no storm of passion in no blindness of wrath we in calm and clear and untempted selfishness pour our poison not for a few only but for multitudes not for those who have wronged us or resisted but for those who have trusted us and aided we not with sudden gift of merciful and unconscious death but with slow waste of hunger and weary rack of disappointment and despair we last and chiefly do our murdering not with any pauses of pity or scorching of conscience but in facile and forgetful calm of mind and so forsooth read day by day complacently as if they meant any one else than ourselves the words that forever describe the wicked the position of asps is under their lips and their feet are swift to shed blood you may indeed perhaps think there is some excuse for many in this matter just because the sin is so unconscious that the guilt is not so great when it is unapprehended and that it is much more pardonable to slay heedlessly than purposefully i believe no feeling can be more mistaken and that in reality and in the sight of heaven the callous indifference which pursues its only interests at any cost of life though it does not definitely adopt the purpose of sin is a state of mind at once more heinous and more hopeless than the wildest aberrations of ungoverned passion there may be in the last case some elements of good and of redemption still mingled in the character but in the other few or none there may be hope for the man who has slain his enemy in anger hope even for the man who has betrayed his friend in fear but what hope for him who trades in unregarded blood and builds his fortune on unrepented treason but however this may be and wherever you may think yourselves bound in justice to impute the greater sin be assured that the question is one of responsibilities only not of facts the definite result of all our modern haste to be rich is assuredly and constantly the murder of a certain number of persons by our hands every year i have not time to go into the details of another on the whole the broadest and terriblest way in which we cause the destruction of the poor namely the way of luxury and waste destroying in improvidence what might have been the support of thousands footnote the analysis of this error will be found completely carried out in my lectures on the political economy of art and it is an error worth analyzing for until it is finally trodden under foot no healthy political economical or moral action is possible in any state i do not say this impetuously or suddenly for i have investigated this subject as deeply and as long as my own special subject of art and the principles of political economy which i have stated in those lectures are as sure as the principles of euclid foolish readers doubted their certainty because i told them i had never read any books on political economy did they suppose i had got my knowledge of art by reading books and footnote but if you follow out the subject for yourselves at home and what i have endeavored to lay before you to-night will only be useful to you if you do 
you will find that wherever and whenever men are endeavoring to make money hastily and to avoid the labor which providence has appointed to be the only source of honorable profit and also wherever and whenever they permit themselves to spend it luxuriously without reflecting how far they are misguiding the labor of others there and then in either case they are literally and infallibly causing for their own benefit or their own pleasure a certain annual number of human deaths that therefore the choice given to every man born into this world is simply whether he will be a laborer or an assassin and that whosoever has not his hand on the stilt of the plough has it on the hilt of the dagger it would also be quite vain for me to endeavor to follow out this evening the lines of thought which could be suggested by the other two great political uses of iron in the fetter and the sword a few words only i must permit myself respecting both the fetter as the plough is the typical instrument of industry so the fetter is the typical instrument of the restraint or subjection necessary in a nation, either literally for its evildoers or figuratively in accepted laws for its wise and good men. You have to choose between this figurative and literal use, for depend upon it, the more laws you accept, the fewer penalties you will have to endure, and the fewer punishments to enforce. For wise laws and just restraints are to a noble nation not chains but chain mail, strength and defense, though something also of an encumbrance. And this necessity of restraint, remember, is just as honorable to man as the necessity of labor. You hear every day greater numbers of foolish people speaking about liberty, as if it were such an honorable thing. So far from being that, it is, on the whole, and in the broadest sense, dishonorable, and an attribute of the lower creatures. No human being, however great or powerful, was ever so free as a fish. There is always something that he must or must not do, while the fish may do whatever he likes. All the kingdoms of the world put together are not half so large as the sea, and all the railroads and wheels that ever were or will be invented are not so easy as fins. You will find, on fairly thinking of it, that it is his restraint which is honorable to man, not his liberty. And what is more, it is restraint which is honorable even in the lower animals. A butterfly is much more free than a bee, but you honor the bee more, just because it is subject to certain laws which fit it for orderly function in bee society. And throughout the world, of the two abstract things, liberty and restraint, restraint is always the more honorable. It is true, indeed, that in these and all other matters you never can reason finally from the abstraction, for both liberty and restraint are good when they are nobly chosen, and both are bad when they are basely chosen. But of the two, I repeat, it is restraint which characterizes the higher creature, and betters the lower creature, and from the ministering of the archangel to the labor of the insect from the poising of the planets to the gravitation of a grain of dust the power and glory of all creations and all matter consist in their obedience not in their freedom the sun has no liberty a dead leaf has much the dust of which you are formed has no liberty its liberty will come with its corruption and therefore i say boldly though it seems a strange thing to say in england that as the first power of a nation consists in knowing how to guide the plough, its second power consists in knowing how to wear the fetter. The sword, and its third power, which perfects it as a nation, consists in knowing how to wield the sword, so that the three talismans of national existence are expressed in these three short words, labor, law, and courage. This last virtue we at least possess and all that is to be alleged against us is that we do not honor it enough. I do not mean honor by acknowledgment of service, though sometimes we are slow in doing even that, but we do not honor it enough in consistent regard to the lives and souls of our soldiers. How wantonly we have wasted their lives, you have seen lately in the reports of their mortality by disease, which a little care and science might have prevented, but we regard their souls less than their lives by keeping them in ignorance and idleness and regarding them merely as instruments of battle 
the argument brought forward for the maintenance of a standing army usually refers only to expediency in the case of unexpected war whereas one of the chief reasons for the maintenance of an army is the advantage of the military system as a method of education the most fiery and headstrong who are often also the most gifted and generous of our youths have always a tendency both in the lower and upper classes to offer themselves for your soldiers others weak and unserviceable in a civil capacity are tempted or entrapped into the army in a fortunate hour for them out of this fiery or uncouth material it is only a soldier's discipline which can bring the full value and power even at present by mere force of order and authority the army is the salvation of myriads and men who under other circumstances would have sunk into lethargy or dissipation are redeemed into noble life by a service which at once summons and directs their energies how much more than this military education is capable of doing you will find only when you make it education indeed we have no excuse for leaving our private soldiers at their present level of ignorance and want of refinement for we shall invariably find that both among officers and men the gentlest and best informed are the bravest still less have we excuse for diminishing our army either in the present state of political events or as i believe in any other conjunction of them that for many a year will be possible in this world you may perhaps be surprised at my saying this perhaps surprised at my implying that war itself can be right or necessary or noble at all nor do i speak of all war as necessary nor of all war as noble both peace and war are noble or ignoble according to their kind and occasion no man has a profounder sense of the horror and guilt of ignoble war than i have i have personally seen its effects upon nations of unmitigated evil on soul and body with perhaps as much pity and as much bitterness of indignation as any of those whom you will hear continually declaiming in the cause of peace but peace may be sought in two ways one way is as gideon sought it when he built his altar in ophrah naming it god send peace yet sought this peace that he loved as he was ordered to seek it and the peace was sent in god's way the country was in quietness forty years in the days of gideon and the other way of seeking peace is as menahem sought it when he gave the king of assyria a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him that is you may either win your peace or buy it win it by resistance to evil buy it by compromise with evil you may buy your peace with silenced consciences you may buy it with broken vows buy it with lying words buy it with base connivances buy it with the blood of the slain and cry of the captive and the silence of lost souls over hemispheres of the earth while you sit smiling at your serene hearths lisping comfortable prayers evening and morning and counting your pretty protestant beads which are flat and of gold instead of round and of ebony as the monks ones were and so mutter continually to yourselves peace peace when there is no peace but only captivity and death for you as well as for those you leave unsaved and yours darker than theirs i cannot utter to you what i would in this matter we all see too dimly as yet what our great world duties are to allow any of us to try to outline their enlarging shadows but think over what i have said and as you return to your quiet homes to-night reflect that their peace was not won for you by your own hands but by theirs who long ago jeopardized their lives for you their children and remember that neither this inherited peace nor any other can be kept but through the same jeopardy no peace was ever won from fate by subterfuge or agreement no peace is ever in store for any of us but that which we shall win by victory over shame or sin victory over the sin that oppresses as well as over that which corrupts for many a year to come the sword of every righteous nation must be whetted to save or subdue 
nor will it be by patience of others suffering but by the offering of your own that you ever will draw nearer to the time when the great change shall pass upon the iron of the earth when men shall beat their swords into ploughshares and their spears into pruning hooks neither shall they learn war any more the end of section thirteen